so much for showing up today in numbers. We know it's the busiest time of the semester and we had to postpone it. Again, blames to another Kenyan. Um, <laughs> but allow me to introduce to you Professor Ali Al Amin Mazrui. Professor Al Ali Al Amin Mazrui, the professor and the director of the Institute of Global Cultural Studies at the State University of New York at Bingham. He's also a senior scholar in Africana Studies at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, and senior fellow of the Prince Al Walid bin Talal Center of Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Currently, he is also president of the Association of Muslim Social Scientists of North America. Dr. Mazrui has served in the past as president of the African Studies Association of the United States, vice president of the International Political Science Association, and chancellor of Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology in Kenya. With the doctor of philosophy from Oxford University, United Kingdom, Professor Madhuri has received multiple honorary doctorates in diverse academic fields and holds national decorations awarded by heads of states of South Africa and Kenya. Professor Mazrui has published more than 30 books and hundreds of articles. His most ambitious books over the years have included a World Federation of Cultures, Cultural Forces in World Politics, and Euro-Jews and Afro-Arabs, the Great Semitic Divergence in World History. Mazrui's most influential television work was his award-winning TV series, The African and People Heritage, in nine episodes, first broadcast by BBC and PBS in 1986, and since shown in diverse countries and translated into several languages. <coughs> A companion book with the same title was published simultaneously. Dr. Mazrui's service to the organization, to the then Organizations of African Unity and the current African Union include membership in the group of eminent persons appointed in 1982 by the Organization of African Union's Presidential Summit to explore the issues of African reparations, and enslavement, and colonization. He was also among the eminent personalities who advised on the transition of Organization of Africa Organization of African Unity to the current African Union in the year 2002. His academic and global leadership involvement has won him much recognition. In 2005, the American Journal of Foreign Policy and the British Journal The Prospect nominated Ali Mazuri among the top 100 public intellectuals alive in the world as a whole. On behalf of the Ghana Club, I present to you Dr. Ali Alam. Thank you. I appreciate that uh, enthusiastic reception and uh, flattered and uh, very pleased. Uh, and you've, you've heard all the jokes about one Kenyan preventing another from coming here. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, and I've got a story to tell for the rest of my life how Barack Obama interfered with my schedule. <laughs> 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 and, uh, uh, um, uh, today's talk has been advertised uh, under different titles, I understand, but uh, and, uh, anybody who regards what I present as something different from what they expected, I hope they will remain anyhow. Uh, and uh, raise questions later on. Uh, but uh, the, the first half of my presentation will, will be uh, about uh, major struggles in Africa for an open society. Uh, and then the second half will, will claim that what is happening uh, in North Africa, uh, as well as in the rest of the Arab world, uh, is a culmination of this struggle for the open society. So the, the first half discusses 
Africa without discussing what is happening right now in North Africa. The second half focuses more on North Africa uh, and the Arab uh, reawakening and Arab renewal or Arab uprising, whichever term you regard as appropriate for the time being. So we have, a, for firstly, sort of 50 years of Africa's struggle for the open society. 50 years of Africa's struggle for the open society. Uh, be, uh, beginning in uh, other parts of Africa and culminating uh, in, in what is happening in Libya today. So phase, phase one is, uh, much of this is familiar to you, phase one is the anti-colonial phase. Uh, and World War II triggered new waves of anti-colonial struggle. Uh, leaders like Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana and Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia uh, considered using Gandhian methods to fight colonialism, uh, that is passive resistance and uh, non-violent strikes uh, and uh, non-cooperation. Uh, Sometimes they use the Gandhian rhetoric much more than they actually implemented the Gandhian ideas, but they were early uh, disciples in Africa uh, of the Gandhian approach to liberation. Uh, then there's another category, leaders like Julius K. Nyerere of Tanzania and Leopold Songo of Senegal, who adopted non-confrontational forms of agitation, because Gandhian methods are they may be non-violent, but they are not non-confrontational. Uh, on the contrary, sometimes requires the corporate evil. But so leaders like Nyerere and Sango and many others adopted non-confrontational <coughs> agitation for decolonization, and it turned out that they worked in the end for those particular societies. Uh, and then you have movements like Mau Mau uh, in Kenya and the National Liberation Front in Algeria engaged in armed struggle. So this is departing from Gandhian methods of uh, non-violence uh, uh, and escalating the confrontation uh, into armed struggle. Uh, so in, in Kenya, we had the Mau Mau movement from the uh, 1950s until uh, the 60s. And by 63, Kenya was able to become independent. I noticed that uh, Tea Party in the United States has discovered that there was something called Mau Mau uh, in Kenya uh, during the lifetime of Barack Obama's father uh, and uh, attribute to Obama's whole approach uh, to Mau Mau. Uh, poor Obama uh, wasn't alive at that time in any case and it's very unlikely he studied Mau Mau, although uh, he might have been curious about it. Uh, and these are different methods of uh, uh, pursuing not the full-scale open society, but ending the foreign impediments to it. Uh, Ghana became independent in 1957. Uh, makes countries like uh, Sudan and uh, Tunisia jealous because Obama's, uh, Ghana's independence gets uh, how shall I say, celebrated almost as the first one, but in fact, it's not the first one. It's just the first one of a totally non-Arab African country. Yeah? Sudan became independent in 1956, not 1957, and, and, and uh, in the case of Tunisia also uh, uh, in, in 1956. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it is true that much of sub-Saharan Africa was treated differently by history and by colonialism, and it was therefore understandable that we would regard 1957 as exceptional as Ghana entered the domain of sovereignty. Uh, by 1960, 17 additional African countries became independent in a single year, and those included countries uh, that are very large, like Nigeria and uh, what we used to call Congo, Kinshasa, uh, and small countries like Gambia. Uh, and then efforts at unification uh, uh, by two parts of the five-part Somali people, 
uh, so they will attempt to get former Italian Somaliland and former British Somaliland uh, to become one country, which they did the, in 1960 <coughs> with great euphoria. Uh, but it's an experiment uh, which hasn't succeeded so far uh, and may need to be approached in a different way in the years ahead. So that's phase one, the anti-colonial phase of the pursuit of the open society, the anti-colonial phase. Uh, then you have the anti-racial phase of the pursuit of the open society. And in this case, I mean a struggle against racial minority governments and policies pursued in Africa, uh, not towards attaining the open society, but towards creating uh, racially discriminatory systems. Uh, I, I grew up in such a country, although it wasn't the worst in Africa, so I grew up in a Kenya which was sub subject to white minority rule, uh, and uh, 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 now although the population of whites in Kenya was much smaller than in the other white settler countries, it was a white settler country, and, and the whites were allowed to get away with a lot when I was growing up as a, uh, as a young man uh, and put resistance to uh, Africanization of the system. Uh, but Southern Africa and Algeria at the north were uh, the biggest arena of this particular form of the pursuit of the open society. In Rhodesia, the target was uh, Ian Smith's white regime in rebellion against Great Britain. Uh, and in rebellion also against the world community and against the aspirations of African peoples. So here Smith has engaged in a unilateral declaration of independence and unleashed on the countries previously called Southern Rhodesia, then Rhodesia, and now Zimbabwe, uh, unleashed 15 years of bloodletting uh, in that country. Uh, uh, Robert Mugabe was successful in gaining independence for Zimbabwe in 1980, but has had a hard time creating a forced racial society. In the first two years, there was a lot of anti-black racism in Harare. Uh, the newly renamed capital of Zimbabwe was Harare. Uh, uh, I had an opportunity at about that time, some of you were not born yet, but uh, uh, to be uh, in Harare and uh, trying to find out why there was still so much anti-black racism in a country which had become independent. And I had occasion to uh, raise that question with Robert Mugabe, who at that time <coughs> was prime minister and, and then later on he became uh, uh, president. Uh, so Mugabe enumerated three methods of teaching one's own citizens to become non-racist. Uh, one by non-racist example, secondly by anti-racism persuasion uh, and anti-racism education, and thirdly by the use of force to promote a post-racial society. Uh, so the reason why I was raising this uh, question with the Prime Minister of Zimbabwe at that time, although the country had recently become independent, you could go to restaurants and see whites ordering uh, waiters around uh, cracking jokes at their expense, uh, calling them names uh, if they are late in drinking the glass of water they've asked for. So they're almost as if we are still in a racist society. Uh, that's why I said, uh, uh, I, I said to Mugabe at the time, I've had more racism in one week in Harare than I normally do in a whole year in the United States. Uh, and that was true at that time. Uh, more recently, as I said, the anti-racism uh, factor in Zimbabwe is really concerned ownership of land, which was disproportionately owned by whites. Uh, at least the best land was disproportionately uh, owned by whites. And then the veterans, i.e. people who voted, uh, who fought uh, for the open society with guns against uh, Ian Smith, were helping themselves to land and chasing out white owners. So in another conversation with Robert Mugabe much more recently, I, I asked him, I reminded him of what he said years ago, that 
that we have ways of persuading people to become non-racist or by uh, example, by persuasion and education and, uh, and only in the last resort by force. Uh, so I asked him, I do not know it's time by force because the, the land was being taken from these people uh, very often for, uh, to going to people who may have been heroes uh, in the fighting for independence, but they are not necessarily the best farmers the country could have. Uh, so Mugabe said to me, uh, you are assuming I started this, I didn't start this. The veterans, meaning the freedom fighters, uh, uh, feel disgusted that so many years after independence, land is still the best land is still disproportionately in white hands. When they help themselves, I had the following options to dress up. I could have sent uh, the police force to arrest uh, those uh, liberation fighters. Uh, the police force stood there, no chance of having enough force for their prison. Or I could have sent the army to do that, they sent a serious risk uh, that they have, might have mutinied on such an issue. Uh, uh, and then if they didn't mutiny on a serious risk, there would be, uh, people would be fighting each other with guns in Zimbabwe. So he said, I agree with the target of what they're trying to do, which is equalizing ownership of land. Uh, between the races, uh, uh, but I'm not responsible for the way it started. I just had to decide whether I could still support it. Uh, uh, of course, next door in South Africa, uh, the suffering of a racism was uh, very often even worse than in, in, in Zimbabwe while the whites were in control. Uh, and in this period we are talking about, South Africa witnessed the massacre of unarmed civilians in Sharpeville in 1960, and the revolt of blacks in Soweto uh, against enforced learning of uh, things which were Africana and which were unrelated to their own experience. So in South Africa, the struggle continued longer than in Zimbabwe, but achieved positive results faster than did the smaller countries. In South Africa, the pace of change <coughs> speeded up after Nelson Mandela was released, uh, and he suffered 17 years in jail. Uh, a deal was struck by the early 1990s. The whites agreed to give blacks the crown if whites could retain the jewels. Uh, so in 1994, Nelson Mandela was able to wear the political crown, <coughs> while white South Africans still enjoy the economic jewels, the prosperity. They're trying to find a way of dealing with the racial distribution of the jewels. Uh, and they do have the equivalent of affirmative action trying to, to reach there, but they haven't reached there yet. Phase three uh, of Africa's struggle in pursuit of the open society. Uh, the struggle for a more pluralistic constitutional order. It just fell short of what is happening right now, but uh, uh, it was well on the way. Uh, Black Africa was partly inspired by anti-communist movements in Eastern Europe uh, in that period, uh, also inspired by uh, the, part the first Palestinian intifada against the Israelis, uh, and also inspired by the agi agitation in Tiananmen Square in China uh, when the young of Beijing were in revolt. Uh, so things were already ready to be triggered off in Africa and much of the world was helping to set the stage. Uh, and Africans started demanding a multi-party system, abolition of single party uh, governance, elimination of detention without trial, a minimization of corruption, and steps against military groups. Yeah. Uh, so from the 1980s to the end of the 20th century, Africa witnessed widespread unrest in pursuit of these uh, constitutional changes. Uh, and the single party system in countries like Tanzania, which uh, was one of the most elaborate 
in establishing the single party system. A whole commission was created to find out whether you could, uh, could have such a system. And Nyerere at that time could argue persuasively that, that you have to create an artificial opposition uh, in order to have a, a multi party system in Tanzania. And the last election under colonial rule, I mean, uh, people who were opposing uh, the, what became the ruling party were one or two people. Uh, so you really have to create an opposition. You are one person who is the opposition, and uh, the same person is the follower of the opposition group. So at that time, Nyerere could argue persuasively that there's no opposition, uh, so what do we do? Uh, so they did inaugurate a single party system, uh, 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 and uh, it lasted into the 1980s. So, yeah, so it lasted in the 1960s, it lasted in the 1980s. Uh, my, my, own, uh, my own country of birth in, next door uh, in Kenya also had a one party system. At first, it was uh, one party de facto, but not by law. So theoretically, you could create a, a rival party. In reality, it was not believed. Yeah. But, but strictly speaking, in Kenya, it didn't become, become one party by law uh, until uh, nearly 20 years after independence. So, uh, so but in generally, if you started as a party, and some did, uh, they found ways of liquidating it. So, but, that also went over the board. The one-party system in uh, Zambia went over the board. In Malawi, went over the board. In, uh, in Ghana, went over the board. So, so the, uh, the idealistic days of single-party governance, where we produced great philosophers legitimating uh, that single party, uh, that ended uh, in the course of uh, late 80s, Now then, phase four, which is, uh, we're beginning to enter what is happening right now, uh, is phase four in Africa's struggle for the open society, uh, which became a struggle for uh, full democracy by popular uprising. Uh, this is a situation of uh, democracy from below, uh, not democracy from above, or experimenting and saying we shall have uh, uh, a system based on uh, some form of uh, Zambian humanism, and uh, Nyerere saying we shall have uh, Ujama and what all those are attempted social reforms from above. Uh, but I'm referring to the beginning of major effort at uh, popular uprising in pursuit of the open society. Uh, contrary to what most of you may believe today, uh, Tunisia was not the first one to do it. Yeah? Uh, uh, it, it just uh, the first one to do it, it did not cause contagion. It, wasn't, it didn't create imitators all over the place. The first one to do it was Sudan. Uh, the, the, the uprising by ordinary students, professors, uh, judges and whatnot in the streets of the capital city uh, against a military <coughs> government was first done by the Sudanese. Uh, and they did it first in, uh, in 1964, civilian non-violent demonstrations against military rule. So it was against General Ibrahim Abu in 1964. And they uh, succeeded. I mean, I would uh, you know, power to the credit of both the military uh, and the civilians in uh, Sudan. Uh, the demonstrations achieved their purpose. Uh, then the next one, and then the soldiers later on find a way of coming coming back. That's the trouble we have right now. We hope, we hope these guys will learn a lesson and not come back. <laughs> uh, but the second one in Sudan was against. Uh, General Jaffa Domeni in 1985. Uh, now the two Sudanese uprisings did not trigger 
imitation, either in sub-Saharan Africa or in the Arab world, uh, contrary to the Tunisian and Egyptian one, which triggered off widespread uh, imitation and copycats. Yeah? So in spite of the fact that the old Sudan shared borders with nine other countries, the country with shared borders with nine other countries, we are going to have a contagion. This is an ideal type of place, you know, sharing borders are all around you. Uh, uh, but it didn't happen. Uh, then uh, you can discuss why didn't it happen? Uh, why did it happen for a country that is much smaller, Tunisia, as compared with Sudan, it's a tiny little country, and suddenly it triggered off these this events, and Tunisia doesn't share borders uh, with none country. I think it shares borders with only three, if I'm mistaken, but, uh, but the Sudanese uh, was a much uh, wider territorial presence uh, on the scene. Uh, so we can discuss that. Uh, you may have ideas that may help us understand why we had to wait <coughs> for another 20 years before uprising based on the pursuit of democracy uh, could be passed on to other societies. Uh, so there was greater participation by women in the 1985 uprising in Sudan against Jaffa de Mary than there was in 1964 against General Ibrahim Aboud. Uh, uh, the trend seemed to be towards greater political consciousness among Sudanese women. And now there was a trigger for greater politicization of women uh, at that time in Sudan, and that women were partly outraged by the mayor's decision to execute uh, Mahmoud Muhammad Taha. Uh, he was a thinker in Sudan uh, uh, who had uh, ideas which were liberal about uh, reinterpreting Islam uh, and uh, argued that uh, uh, the, there are two ways of dealing with Islam. There were two messages in Islam. One message was directed at Muhammad's contemporaries in the seventh century of the common era, or, or a Christian era. So, so and some of the ayahs uh, of the Quran are clearly about the politics of the day <coughs> when the Prophet Muhammad is the word of God. Uh, uh, they're talking about Abu Lahab and one of the, it's really the politics of the day. Uh, so Muhammad, Muhammad Taha said, said uh, parts of the Quran which are addressed to Muhammad's contemporaries, the first Muslims in history, uh, using the historical definition of Muslims uh, rather than the theological definition of Muslims, which would take you to Adam and Eve, uh, the historical definition of Muslims. This is the first Muslims, and the, the argument of Muhammad, Muhammad was part of the Quran addressed to Muhammad's contemporaries. Uh, and the second part uh, was addressed to eternity, universally, uh, to all human beings across all ages. And the importance of understanding the Quran is to be able to distinguish between uh, what was intended to be time specific to the people who are the Prophet Muhammad's contemporaries. Uh, and time universal. Uh, uh, in this interpretation, Mahmoud Muhammad Taha also had an interpretation which, which failed, favored the kind of feminist, feminist, feminist moral pose. In other words, uh, many of the things which appear to be uh, anti women are really dealing with Arabs who, had, who at the time of the Prophet Muhammad were just coming out of female infanticide. They were actually killing their baby girls. I'm, I've had two daughters. Uh, I'm not going to let the third one survive. Uh, so you either give me a boy or I'll kill the child. And they did. They killed the child. So, so the argument here is that Muhammad was dealing with the people uh, whose value of 
with male children instead of uh, female children it was worse than today's China uh, in the sense of uh, devaluing their female babies. Uh, and that's some of the arguments which appear in Islam to be uh, contrary uh, to fairness to women uh, who are products of addressing Muhammad's contemporaries. What happened to Mahmoud Muhammad Taha? Anybody knows? Yeah. Uh, it's a pity. It's a pity how some martyrs just drift into oblivion. Yeah. He was executed. Yeah. He many executed this old man uh, on charges of apostasy, uh, heresy, etc. So the revolt against Jaffa de Mary, the, uh, well, one of the reasons why there was greater female involvement is that uh, women were particularly outraged by the injustice done by Mahmoud Muhammad uh, I don't know whether your library has it, and it's definitely out of print. There is a translation of these views in a book called The Second Message of Islam. The Second Message of Islam. So, uh, if, if you are interested, uh, the Baha is spelled T A H A. T A H A. Okay. Now, the current uprising in the Arab world, women have a more pronounced presence in some of them than in either of the Sudanese ones. Either of the Sudanese ones. Uh, uh, but I want to propose the following, that the, uh, the, the women have been more engaged in the opposition in the current Arab awakening uh, in situations where what is happening is protest as distinct from situation of whether, where what is happening is rebellion. Yeah. Uh, so in Tunisia and Egypt, the whole opposition and this movement consisted of protesters. Uh, it did not consist of rebels. Uh, but in Libya, the opposition turned from protest to rebellion. Yeah. How does that happen? Well, what's the difference between protest and rebellion? The difference is when the opposition is armed. The Libyan opposition turned to weapons and transformed the conflict into a civil war. That didn't happen in either Tunisia or in Cairo, in spite of the fact that in Cairo, Mubarak's side used violence, uh, but the opposition still resisted the temptation of turning into an armed struggle. This violence, and up to 200 people died in Cairo and Alexandria uh, during the Tahrir Square struggle. Uh, uh, but as I say, in general, the violence was done by the government side. The position continued to do a non violent resistance. The Tunisian and Egyptian opposition did seek uh, an open society, but through non violent struggle. Uh, now let's look at uh, let's look at these uh, different cases we have. One is the Tunisian style. Uh, what has now been called the Arab Awakening uh, was uh, triggered, as you know, by the uprising in, in Tunisia in January this year against the regime of Zain al Abidin bin Ali. Uh, was it merely a coincidence that Tunisia as a country led in the 20th century, the whole of the Arab world on this issue of the quest for open society. It's quite, among Arab countries, this is quite a small country, uh, Tunisia. So, so the, the seed of Tunisia's liberation, uh, was it a coincidence that the liberation of women in Tunisia uh, was started earlier than in any part of the so in other words, is there a link between the women's liberation in Tunisia, which 
started much earlier than anywhere else in the Arab world. Uh, uh, there's a link between that and uh, the democratization uh, uprising in January 2011. Uh, by the 1920s, Tunisia had produced an outstanding Islamic reformer who belonged to the great mosque of Zaytuna. The man's name was Zahar Haddad, who championed the liberation of women from the shackles of what he regarded as un-Islamic customs and taboos. Uh, in 1930, he published his influential book, Our Women in the Sharia and Society. Uh, uh, and the book was arguing against the, the Islamic teaching, which uh, Haddad argued had been distorted to the disadvantage of women. So he wasn't a rebel against Islam. He just said that Islam was hijacked uh, by sexist males and made to serve the purposes of the male of the species. So Tunisian women were inspired by Haddad, but initially they decided to join the national struggle against French colonialism rather than fight <coughs> feminist battle. So women patriots started being arrested by French colonialists as early as 1938. By 1915, the leading neo party of Tunisia had opened its first women's section by 1950. Many women agitators against France in Tunisia were from time to time in prison. Now, on attainment of independence, in March 1956, women's credentials as Tunisian patriots were so strong that the first post-colonial resident uh, of Tunisia, Habib Bourguiba, leader of the neo Dastur party, declared within months of independence that Tunisia owed its women a debt of gratitude not only for their roles as mothers, wives, and sisters, but also for their roles as nationalists and patriots. Uh, and Tunisia led the Arab world by promul promulgating what was called a code of personal status, removing injustices against women and conferring upon them uh, uh, what were regarded as full rights. Uh, Tunisia was the first Arab country to outlaw polygamy but not the first Muslim country to outlaw polygamy. Can anyone guess what is the first Muslim country to outlaw polygamy? Yeah, because don't think of Arabic speakers. Uh, think of other Muslims, yeah? Afghanistan? What? Afghanistan? Afghanistan? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting suggestion, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, was a, it was an outlaw, but there were definitely people in Afghanistan who were against polygamy from quite early. But they, were, they went the other way on violence, they went the other way. Uh, so, in general, first, uh, I've taught in American classes enough not to take it for granted that everybody knows the difference between Arab and Muslim. As, as, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm sure this distinguished company does, uh, but just in case there are one or two who are not sure. That an Arab is defined by language. Yeah. A Muslim is defined by religion. Yeah. Uh, an Arab is a person whose mother tongue is Arabic or who is descended from people whose mother tongue is Arabic. Yeah. And there are millions of Arabs who are not Muslims. So the, although the majority of Arabs are Muslims, uh, there are millions who are not Muslims. On the other hand, uh, a Muslim is defined by religion. Yeah. Uh, and Arabs are only a minority of the population of the Muslims of the world. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, the majority of the Muslims of the world are not Muslims. The great majority. 
hang on to the distinction between language and religion. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> then you can begin to do research. Uh, so if you, uh, even if you are calculating which are the biggest uh, Muslim countries in the world, you may not reach an Arab country until you are number five or number six. So you will say Indonesia, you will say Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, and you might even include India. India majority is Hindus, but it still has nearly 150 million Muslims. Uh, 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 so even India is ahead of the Arab world. Uh, in terms of proportion of Muslims in any single country. So bear that in mind, yeah. Uh, so then I said Tunisia was the first Arab country uh, to have a personal code of status for women which included uh, the outlawing of polygamy. Uh, but Tunisia was not the first Muslim country and the first Muslim country was Turkey. The first Muslim country is the big uh, and a man called Mustafa Kemal, who then acquired the title of Ataturk, A T A T U R K, uh, uh, led the way in improving the status of women in marriage, inheritance, and dress culture. And much later, Turkey became the first Muslim country in the Middle East to elect a female prime minister. Uh, Chan Suchila, long before the United States <coughs> has had a female president. Remember that, long before the United States has had a female president. Uh, and, uh, in Tunisia, women in the year 2011 were uh, participants in the pro-democracy uprising as protesters rather than uh, as rebels. Uh, it remains to be seen if Tunisia will be the first Arab country to elect a woman prime minister. As of now, four Muslim countries in the world have had women as either president or prime minister. In those four Muslim countries, there is an, an additional woman, so there have been five Muslim women who have been either president of Prime Minister long before the United States uh, that a female uh, president or France a female president or Italy a female Prime Minister uh, or and in fact until uh, four years ago long before uh, uh, Germany had a female Chancellor. Now it does have a female Chancellor but it was beaten to that role by four different Muslim countries. Uh, and the Muslim countries are Pakistan, uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Indonesia, uh, as well as Turkey, yeah, which have produced uh, women national chief executive uh, long before many Western countries have done. But not a single one of those Muslim countries, or rather a woman at the top, is an Arab. Not a single one right? is an Arab. So in Tunisia, if Tunisia in 2011 led the Arab pro-democratic awakening, was it partly because it had led the Arabs half a century earlier in women's liberation. The immediate figure of the Tunisian uprising was the self-immolation, self-burning of a young trader who was victimized by bureaucrats at the expense of his livelihood. Uh, uh, so he, he was involved as a food cart vendor. And the bureaucrats of the country were pushing him around. <coughs> uh, uh, and he set himself aflame in protest. It's a very unusual type of situation in Muslim countries. Uh, Self-immolation and burning yourself is more common among Hindus, more common among Buddhists, uh, but uh, it's much, much rare uh, among Muslims. But it did happen in Tunisia, and it happened in such a manner that the young man did become a symbol of mass, political martyrdom. Although politically inspired self-immolation uh, was so unusual 
and the most important funder, the Tunisian suicide of the food cart vendor in January 2011 produced what Tunisian regarded as a heroic march. <coughs> the physical flames which consumed the young man became a political flame which helped to light a revolution. Tunisian mothers were reportedly particularly moved by the young man's rage. Uh, so you have a small Arab country doing this, and suddenly it's the largest Arab country that is politically put aflame, Egypt. Egypt, although its uh, population of Muslims is smaller than the other Muslim countries I mentioned earlier, among Arabs it is the largest country in population. Uh, so Muslim Mubarak was ousted February 11, 2011, Women were very, very visible participants in, in Tahrir Square as protesters. Egyptian women, though among the best educated in Africa and the Muslim world, and the Muslim world were not as liberated as the women of Tunisia and Turkey. But historically, Egypt has led the way in female empowerment. So if you're taking the whole uh, span of Egyptian history, which is thousands of years old. Uh, the first great female ruler in recorded history uh, was the Egyptian Hatshepsut, who reigned before Christ, 1479 to 1488. Um, I think uh, she also had ambitions on Somalia, you know. I think she sent some uh, what not trying to conquer. Somali people, yeah. Uh, uh, but that was a bad voice. <laughs> uh, but because Pharaoh was supposed to be made, the Hatshepsut was represented in statues with a false beard. Uh, she was a strong ruler and widely regarded as a forerunner of such tough female rulers as Catherine the Great, Elizabeth the I, and Indira Gandhi. Other great women rulers of Egypt included Pharaoh Akhenaten's co-regent, Queen Nefertiti, and other great women uh, in Egypt included Cleopatra, arguably the last of the great pharaohs of ancient Egypt, so she was less indigenous than Hatshepsut and uh, Nefertiti. Uh, so Egypt has had in its huge history, uh, uh, a role of women, but it has been much more in the past than in the present. Uh, Egypt is a northern extension of sub-Saharan Africa, a southern extension of Mediterranean Europe, and became the eastern extension of Arabia after the birth of Islam. And these influences have helped the relative liberation of Egyptian women. So they are more liberated than women in the Arabian Peninsula, even if less liberated uh, than women in Turkey and Tunisia. OK, the next subsection is the Libyan situation, uh, including the female situation. As you know, Libya has had <coughs> since 1969, uh, he came to power uh, and abolished the monarchy. That was the monarchy. Uh, 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 and he has been in power ever since. So on the gender question, he has used symbolism. Far from regarding women as unsuited for military roles or incapable of using firearms efficiently, Gaddafi theoretically entrusted his life to female bodyguards. Uh, the Pope in history has had the physical protection of the Swiss guards and the spiritual protection of the Virgin Mary. Gaddafi has had women bodyguards who are specifically required to be virgins. Uh, on the link between virginity and military effectiveness, Gaddafi in North Africa 
in the 21st century has shared a characteristic with Shaka Zulu of South Africa in the 18th century. Shaka wanted his male soldiers to be celibate, that is not married and not having sex. They uh, totally denying themselves sex. Uh, uh, and there are even stories that he used to test them. So, uh, uh, this young man standing there outside in a drizzle, this is Shaka, young man naked, uh, and then uh, a very beautiful woman who come out also naked uh, and dance, uh, very suggestive dances. Uh, and if any, any of the soldiers, uh, organs, Showed signs of excitement. It was trouble. <laughs> you have failed the test. <laughs> and you might fail. <laughs> well, fortunately, the Gaddafi didn't engage in such outrageous. <laughs> but he did use female guards as virgins from the start and committed celibacy until military years after. But since the, since the current uprising, erupted in the second half of 2011, there's been no evidence of female soldiers protecting Gaddafi. Actually, there have been more female warriors in opposition in Benghazi than among Gaddafi forces in Tripoli. Uh, much more interesting is Gaddafi's decision from the 1990s that he was an African first and an Arab second. That's very rare uh, for Arab leaders to decide the Africans first uh, and Arab second, but uh, Gaddafi did. He got disenchanted with fellow Arabs, having first begun as a pan-Arabist. He, uh, he regarded uh, himself as somebody who can lead the continent, uh, and he put his money in, in some of pan-African ventures. Uh, more money increasingly than in any pan-Arabist projects. He saw himself less and less as heir to the man of the Nasser and more as heir to Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, in, in fact, to such an extent that uh, his uh, colleagues, including Museveni, said this, this man has gone, Gaddafi has gone so idealistic, he wants instant United States of Africa. Uh, uh, some people argue this is very similar to Kuma, <laughs> uh, as the instant United States of Africa. Uh, uh, and Museveni criticized that, yeah, Museveni criticized of Uganda, has criticized that Gaddafi was unrealistic in his pace of pan-Africanization. So I've had a very interesting experience of having met Gaddafi more than once, uh, and having had the a prolonged dinner with him uh, in his famous tent <laughs> some years ago. If you're, if you're in England and you're invited to the palace, uh, that's a great honor. Uh, in Gaddafi, if you're invited to the tent, <laughs> that's the honor. Uh, and and I, I was also su surprised to find myself defending Arabs against an Arab leader. So Gaddafi was saying so many uh, nasty things about the Arab world uh, that he had one of his guests saying, well, now it's not going too far, uh, etc. So he was really saying nasty things uh, about the Arabs uh, that he, he, even I as a guest said, uh, uh, oh, wait a minute, maybe we should look at this <laughs> more carefully. Uh, the biggest surprise on one of the evenings I was uh, with Gaddafi uh, is that he, asked, he never asked me for any of my books, which hurt a lot. <laughs> 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 but he, he did ask for a book written by my dad. <laughs> I felt offended. <laughs> There's a history book written by my dad from the Masri dynasty of Mombasa. Uh, the old man who did originally wrote it in Arabic, then 
and it was translated by a British scholar, a British scholar into English and published by Oxford University Press, uh, both versions, Arabic and, and English, uh, in, the same, in the same volume. Uh, and, 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 and honored by the British Academy. The book was singled out for special honor by the British Academy. So my old man has really put me in my place. <laughs> long after his death, long after his death, uh, this book came out in the 1990s. Well, I've never found out uh, how come Gaddafi knew about it, but when he asked for a copy, I could understand uh, where he was coming from. At least I assume it's part of this uh, notion that uh, uh, there is some something which I have named Afrabia, uh, which is a meeting meeting point between Arab, Arab ness and African ness, uh, and that he was moving to a greater commitment to Africa. He had, I did send him my father's book. Uh, he, he never asked for my own, uh, but now that he's in trouble, maybe I'll forgive him. <laughs> <laughs> now in the present situation. Gaddafi has paid a price for preferring his African identity because he alienated fellow Arabs to a disastrous extent. Disastrous for him. Yeah. Uh, I never thought I'd see the day when the Arab League would give a green light to the United States. Go bomb an Arab country. I never thought I'd see such a day. But it happened. The Arab League actually permitted the Western world. Uh, to attack the Rafi's country, and I'm, I'm sure if, if Obama is speaking the truth, that he only was only prepared to do it if the region was on the side of attack. If, if he's speaking the truth, I'm quite sure the region would not have authorized it if the Rafi was in good standing with fellow Arabs. So he squandered his Arabness, uh, which at that time pleased people like, like me who are Africans. Uh, at last, or at least one Arab leader regarded his Africanness as more important than his Arabness, but uh, his history has made him pay dearly uh, for that uh, right now. Uh, so the Arab League virtually threw him under the bus. Uh, give the green light to the Security Council and the Western power to bomb him. My final uh, country is Yemen, because unfortunately it's moving in, in a similar direction toward the Civil War. So it's, they're much more restrained in becoming an armed struggle than <laughs> the government, uh, uh, Ali Abdel Masala. Than the Libyan war against uh, Gaddafi. But it's moving in that direction, unfortunately. Uh, Yemen's links to Africa uh, uh, have gone back a long time. Uh, in Eastern Africa, very strong. Uh, uh, in Somalia, in Ethiopia, in Kenya. Uh, we have from a subsection of uh, Yemen, Hadramaut. Uh, uh, people in Eastern Africa, Hadrami, uh, available as shopkeepers, merchants, intellectuals, Muslim missionaries. On the gender question, uh, Yemeni has uh, marginalized women because uh, uh, Yemeni, believe it or not, like Americans, has principle of the right to bear arms, the right to bear arms. I sometimes suspect Americans borrowed it from the Yemenis. Uh, the Yemenis definitely did not borrow it from the Americans. They've had it for hundreds of years. Uh, uh, so that they not only own weapons, but they often wear weapons. Uh, wear weapons. And some, some families, I'm told, by by Arab witnesses, I hope they are right. Some families even own a tank or two, <laughs> but <laughs> private. <laughs> 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 and so this culture of militarized manhood 
has contributed to the marginalization of women in Yemen, uh, which also happened to be the poorest Arab country. Uh, but the most famous woman in the history of Yemen uh, is the Queen of Sheba. Jewish biblical and Quranic versions of the Queen of Sheba place her in a kingdom called Saba in Yemen instead of in Ethiopia. So Yemen competes with Ethiopia in claiming the Queen of Sheba. But Ethiopia is taking the legacy much more energetically than to the Yemenis. The Emperor Menelik I is supposed to have been the offspring of Solomon and Sheba, and Ethiopians believe uh, that King Solomon's Ark of the Covenant is protected today in Aksum, a part of Ethiopia. Uh, the, the, the divine right of the Emperor is traced to the Covenant. Uh, and the, the, uh, and the, those of you who are Ethiopians will correct me. Uh, there's a fascinating <coughs> story about uh, the seduction, Solomon's seduction of Sheba. Uh, Sheba said, when approached by the king, said, no, 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 your majesty. <laughs> uh, and uh, the king said, what if you help yourself to anything of mine without my permission? Uh, will I be able to have you? Will I have your permission then? Uh, and uh, uh, the queen said, why should I have anything of yours without your permission? Uh, okay, uh, let's, let's find that as a deal. So King Solomon goes and whispers to his cook to put certain things in the curry, uh, in the stew. Uh, and this would be thirst-inducing addition the stew. Uh, so the queen enjoys the dinner enormously, and then retires to her uh, rooms, then wakes up very thirsty, uh, looks around, nobody puts a bottle like this <laughs> nearby. So she gets up and looks around and says that sees a jug of water, uh, approaches it. Uh, pours it into the cup, ready to drink it. And, uh, Solomon turns up and says, you are drinking my water uh, without my permission. You must keep the deal. Uh, so the, the story of the uh, seduction then ends in a pregnancy uh, which produced, did it produce Menelik the first? <laughs> so just Benedict the first, who became one of the great emperors. Uh, then in terms of gender, one, this was uh, also a country, Ethiopia, which uh, produced uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, first major uh, female ruler in the, more or less uh, the, the last hundred years. So the, this is uh, Queen Zeoditu, daughter of Benedict the second. Uh, who reigned in Ethiopia from 1916 to 1930. Uh, okay, uh, I think research in places in New England should join the scholarly effort to try and understand the probable causes and likely consequences of the most remarkable democratizing political contagion since the collapse of the Soviet Union and of communism in Eastern Europe. This Arab awakening, a projected symposium uh, uh, in New York uh, in, under our auspices will almost certainly be followed by further research and publication, in, probably in both English and Arabic. So we need to understand why it happened, uh, uh, it, what are its consequences, uh, will it uh, have long-term consequences, uh, or will it be like the Sudanese uprising of 64 and 85, which were exciting at the time, but were only uh, temporary stories. In recent years, political scientists have increasingly examined the hypothesis 
that mature democracies do not go to war against each other. Political scientists are increasingly convinced that it's inconceivable that France and Germany would ever go to war against each other again, because they are now both mature democracies. Uh, and it's inconceivable that Great Britain and Italy uh, would go to war uh, because they have reached a stage of democratization uh, which is fundamentally demilitarizing against with each other. And the thesis is not that democratic countries don't go to war. They don't go to war against other democratic countries. Yeah. Uh, so the United States, States has all sorts of wars against uh, non-democratic countries. Uh, so the, the long-term consequences, uh, uh, then, uh, do they mean this very explosive region we call the Middle East uh, will become more pacified <coughs> as a result uh, of what has happened uh, in Fifth Canada? Uh, so institutes in New England uh, are well placed to participate in the relevant research on scholarship. And the New England tradition has produced not only authors of relevant books and articles, uh, but also produced leaders in the study of Islam and democracy uh, and the presidents of Muslim institutions relevant to understanding uh, Muslim civilization. Uh, so I hope this part of the country will add its immense talents towards greater understanding between the United States and the Muslim world in this new phase in Arab history. What must not be forgotten are the different roles of women. Articulate when the opposition consists of protesters, but more cautious when protesters become rebels. The story of powerful women in North Africa goes back to Hatshepsut and Cleopatra. In more modern times, the range is from Madame Vahera bin Brad of Tunisia in 20th century to Queen Zeudito of Ethiopia before World War II. We must understand the role of women protesting or rebelling. And we must understand where we are in the long story of African quest for the open society. Thank you very much.